children. From the story of Noah, we all learned the importance of obedience. But I was just wondering, would Noah have known the importance or significance of the task that he was doing, of the ark that he was building? And would Noah have thought, Oh Lord, this is too much for me. This task is so huge. And would he have wondered whether he would be able to complete building the ark? I'm pretty sure Noah would have had tough times. It would have taken him a long time to finish building the ark. And during that time, he would have had to persevere and finish the task. I have a question for you. What if God is going to ask you today to build an ark? Would you build it? Or are you thinking, why would God ask me to build an ark? Maybe not an ark, but God has asked us to build something else. Do you know what it is? Are you curious to find it out? The person whom we are going to learn about today built what God asked the person to build. Shall we listen to the story? The story goes long, long ago. Way back in 1792, when William Carey was in India, he wrote a book, An Enquiry into the Obligations of a Christian. He was so passionate to reach out to India. And this small book that he wrote went all the way to New England, USA, and five young people read it and thus started the Haystack Revival Movement. These five people became the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Mission and they started sending many missionaries to the remotest parts of Southeast Asia. Two of them, Gordon Hall and Samuel Newell, landed in Bombay around 1818 and they wrote a booklet, The Cry of the 600 Million and this booklet reached Boston and a person called Dr. John Scudder was deeply convicted to come to India as a missionary and he came around 1820 and on December 9, 1870 was born this little girl, Ida, as a granddaughter to John Scudder. Let us listen to more about her through her own voice. My grandfather came to India in response to an appeal after reading a leaflet given to him by one of his patients. This leaflet depicted the urgent need of millions in India who were without medical aid and desperately needed help. Dr. John Scudder and his wife dedicated themselves to the medical and evangelistic work in India. They gave their entire lives and their seven sons, who all became doctors, and two daughters came back to India. I am the daughter of the youngest son, John. I was born in India and lived here until five years of age. During the Great Famine in 1875 in South India, it was reported that three million people died of starvation. Those were dark days with suffering and death on all sides, and a great impression was made on my young life. At the end of the famine, my father and mother took me to America. Even as a child, I started most, em stated most emphatically that I could never return to India. I could not forget the terrible impression of suffering and death. My parents returned but left their children in America to continue their education. Some years later, my mother was taken ill and father wrote asking me to return to India and be with them for a time. When I was preparing to return, my many friends said, we thought you were never going back to India. I said, my mother is ill and needs me, and when she is better, I will come home. I will never 
remain in India. Interesting, right? When we see people suffer, what do we do? Let's say you see a small girl on the roadside who's suffering, who's poor, who is shabbily dressed, who doesn't have food to eat, or we see an old lady who's sick and tired, or someone who's very lonely, who doesn't have anyone to love them. What do we do? Sometimes we try to just close our eyes and say, oh no, I can't bear to see them suffer. And then try to run away in the other direction. But is that what God wants us to do? Is not God asking us to stay, to reach out and help those who are suffering? At times we tell ourselves, God won't call me to help someone. I mean, helping someone who is suffering and all is a serious business. It's, it's something very difficult. God would have equipped people. Somebody else would do it. What can I do? And Ida also probably thought like that. But let's see what happened in Aunt Ida's life. Remember, she was 24 years old when she came back to India to help her sick mother. And then this happens. One evening, I was sitting alone in my room, reading when I heard steps on the veranda. And soon a knock. I went to the door and saw a Brahmin gentleman. I asked him if I could do anything for him. Oh, yes, Amma, he said. I so need your help. My wife is dying in childbirth. And Amma, she is such a lovely girl. I heard that you would come to India, and I thought you could help her. But I replied, I know nothing about childbirth, but my father is a doctor, and I can bring him. He can save your little wife. Almost in horror, he raised his hands, saying, I could not take a man into my house. No man can look upon my wife. If you cannot come, she must die. He left and I sat down at my desk, feeling desperate. After some time, I heard footsteps. I ran to the door, thinking that the Brahmin had returned. Instead, there stood a Mohammedan, and with the same request, he too turned away, repeating the same words, Oh, she must die. I felt I could not bear it. And again I heard footsteps in the same evening. Similar requests came from a third man. There was no sleep for me that night. I could not forget those three young women dying in childbirth when I could not help them. By morning, my decision was made. I could go to America, study medicine, and return to India as a doctor to try to save the lives of those who needed me. In the space of one night, a young woman had made a life-changing decision. It was an act of faith, and she remained true to that call for the rest of her life. Everyone who lives in this world is created in the image of God. And even now, just like in the time of Noah, we see people angry at each other. We see people fighting, yelling, and they hurt each other. They even kill each other. And on the other side, we see people who are victims. We see people suffering. We see people hurt. We see people in pain. People are dying around us every day. There are people who are sick, people who can't afford education, people who can't afford a roof above their head, people who don't have good clothes, people who don't have good families. And what are we doing about it? There are people who do not know about the love of God. And we read in the Bible, the God of the Bible, his heart is yearning for them. He's telling us, go reach out to them. Help those who are suffering. The God of the Bible is asking us to reach out. Just like he told Isaiah, he's asking us today, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? 
whom shall I send? Like Isaiah, will you say, here I am, Lord, send me. Like Samuel, would you sit down in his presence and say, speak, Lord, I am listening. And when he tells you what to do, like Mary, would you say, I am your servant, Lord. Will you go for the Lord? Will you go for the Lord like Aunt Ida did? Submitting to him your entire life to do his work for the people he created in his image. Immediately after graduation, Aunt Ida set out to mobilize funds to build a hospital in Bellur in India. The following year, she started uh, to come back to India and after she came back, a few, uh, few months later, her father passed away. And all of the patients whom her father was treating should be now taken care of by Aunt Ida. And people did have their doubts initially. They were thinking, there's this young lady who's just finished her education. What can she do for us? But Aunt Ida was bold. She didn't even have many assistants. The only assistant that she had was her mother. They didn't have a good hospital set up and she had to make do with the mission bungalow that she had. And she did all that she could do for the Lord, even in that place. And in 1902, she built a small hospital with the fund that she had. And then she started treating people there. For 22 years, she was the only surgeon in that place and she did well. She wouldn't mind anything. She would travel in train or carriages or pony cart, any way just to reach out to the people to help them. She even set roadside clinics so that people could just come and get help by her. And these roadside clinics would be set up in remote places where people could not come from that place to Bellur. She had this, some small one-cylinder car which she used for her travel and she just could go everywhere and do all that she could do for the Lord. She did train nurses to work in her hospital, but that was never enough for her. She always wanted to do more. So in this uh, missionary medical conference one day, she just boldly got up and said, I propose that this body approve the founding of a medical school for women. And I propose that we start the plans immediately. And everyone was stunned. I mean, this is not a simple thing. Medical school. And they were like, we don't have money. Who will give us money to build such a huge school? And think about the government. Are they going to immediately give us all the provisions and permissions to build the school? And people said, no, it's impossible. And Ida wouldn't back off. She took few of them to remote villages to show them the state of uh, the people in our country. And she told them that there are very, very few lady doctors to help them. And their hearts melted and they were too convicted by the Lord and the plans proceeded for CMC Vendor. In the beginning, the college had no buildings of its own. So they were in rented places only. And in 1918, the first batch of 17 uh, women came to study. And in 1922, 14 of them graduated. That in itself was a huge success. And uh, six of them uh, got prizes for the Madras presidency. And one girl got the gold medal for anatomy, competing with all men from six different medical schools. Such was the excellence of education that she had offered. But all this is not without difficulties. She had difficulties all the way through. When she was 72 years old and the school was like uh, 20 years old, uh, there was this huge blow by the government. The government said, you should upgrade to university status, otherwise no license for you guys. And it's not a simple deal to upgrade to university status. The number of hospital beds had to be doubled. So many new departments, medical departments had to be established and it was like the finances needed were almost $1 million. Many of us would have just backed off and said, Oh, 
I am 72, retirement, I am not going to do anything anymore. Let someone else take up the job. But not Aunt Ida. What she did was, she buckled up to the job. She went around three years in the North American continent trying to raise fund. And yes, she did. And that's how the CMC College grew even more. She died when she was 90 years old. Almost at the end, someone asked her what she felt of building this huge college and hospitals and a lot of new departments. She just smiled and said, God has been very good to me. What humility, right? What gratitude. No pride, nothing saying, I did it, my strength. Giving all the glory to God. That's the kind of person she was. Let's listen to this 100-year-old granny, one of the first batch of uh, nursing diploma students she was. Let's listen to her talk about Aunt Ida. Very, very special. And she used to take you once a week our morning prayers. And she always read Corinthians 13th chapter. She taught me several things. One thing which was uh, obvious was her humility. The way she, she would uh, come to meetings after she retired. But she wouldn't say a word, she would listen. Usually people who have had a lot of experience will uh, start talking, but she kept quiet. And then her way of dealing with people, her uh, longing to help the others. We used to go for a roadside clinic with her and the patients under the trees they'll gather together and we will take our dressing trays and we will give injections all that but then we sit together and have our meals together and as she would never think of student and doctor or anything we are all part of the family Oh, she was like a mother. I remember her in her blue dress and her blue eyes and the young, uh, pretty doctor uh, came and uh, welcomed us when we first went to the hospital. And she was so happy and she said, well, I'm sure we all will work together and build God's kingdom. So what are you going to build for God? And Ida didn't think she was just building a hospital. She didn't think she was just building a medical school. She didn't think she was just building a task force of doctors and nurses. She knew what she was building. She often used to say, what you are building is not a medical school. It is the kingdom of God. Yes, children, you and me, we are also called to build the kingdom of God. Even today, God is calling you saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Will you say yes? Will you be obedient to this call? And if in your heart God is speaking to you today to ask you to build his kingdom, stay strong. Don't be troubled, don't be overwhelmed if you think that you feel clueless and lost and you really don't know what to do for God. Just be patient and wait in His presence. For Aunt Ida's favorite song was, Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. He will be your vision. 
he will tell you what to do. His word tells us that his word is a lamp to our feet and a guide to our path. Wait in his presence and he will show you how to build his kingdom.